Our second reading this morning comes from the 40th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. The 40th chapter of Isaiah opens a, a new section of that book. Uh, comes from a, a different prophet, sometimes called Second Isaiah, who operates many years after the prophet in the earlier portion. The scene has shifted now from Israel to Babylon, where the people are now in exile. And the prophet's mission has changed from that of his predecessor as well. So let us listen for what the Spirit would say to us through these words. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have you not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is God who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when God blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these? God, it is God who brings out their host and who numbers them, calling them all by name. Because God is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from Yahweh? and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? God, Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, who does not faint or grow weary, whose understanding is unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and grow weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Over this past year or so, I've heard many voices calling for the church to find its prophetic voice, to speak truth to power. And in a time when some Christians have been willing to excuse the most hateful, misogynist, racist behavior in order to gain or maintain power, it is incumbent upon us to proclaim the way of Jesus, a way that has special concern for the weak, the poor, the despised, the oppressed. We do need to speak truth, God's truth, to power. Many of the biblical prophets did exactly that, condemning kings and ruling class for policies that enrich the wealthy and injured the poor, blasting empty religious show that cared little for matters of justice or a rightly ordered world. But there is more to prophecy than this. Prophets seek to 
get people aligned with God. Sometimes that means chastising them, warning them what will happen if they don't straighten up. That explains why a lot of people think that prophecy is about predicting the future, but such prophecy is rarely predictive in any absolute sense. It is rather a call to change and so create a different future. But prophecy need not be warning, and that is the case in our scripture reading today. As I said, here the prophet speaks to exiles in Babylon. Jerusalem and its great temple has been destroyed, and these exiles struggle to maintain their religious traditions in a strange and foreign land. Some have concluded that the gods of Babylon are stronger than their god. Or perhaps God has simply abandoned them. If only they had listened to the warnings of prophets in the past, but now it is too late. God no longer pays any attention to their prayers. In such a situation... The job of the prophet is not to call people to straighten out. It is rather to help them remember. To shake them out of their spiritual amnesia. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? They have forgotten who this Yahweh is. Memory fails them. They cannot see past the current suffering and loss, and so hope and faith evaporates. And so the prophet must call them to remember. The prophet reminds them that it is Yahweh who stretched out the heavens, who filled the cosmos with stars. To Yahweh, the the greatest of the Babylonian rulers are but grass who wither and blow away in the heat of the desert. Do they not remember this God who brought them out of slavery in Egypt? Who brought them into a good and fertile land? Then the prophet turns and addresses the fear that God has abandoned them, has rejected them, once again seeking to jar Israel's memory. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from Yahweh, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, who does not faint or grow weary, whose understanding is unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. If Israel will only trust in Yahweh, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And if we had continued reading from the prophet, we would have heard him assure the people that God is about to stir, God is about to rescue Israel. We would have heard him continue trying to jar Israel's memory, to shake her out of her spiritual amnesia. Several years ago, Brian McLaren wrote a book with the rather unwieldy title, Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad Cross the Road? Christian Identity in a Multi-Faith World. And in it, McLaren suggests that many of us are suffering from something that he calls conflicted religious identity syndrome, or CRIS. According to McLaren, 
Christian identity in America has traditionally operated on a continuum. At one end of this continuum, strong, vigorous Christian identity is paired with a hostility towards outsiders. People who have this strong, hostile Christian identity can be kind and friendly to outsiders, but only in the hope of converting them. Now, at the other end of this continuum, hostility is replaced with respect and tolerance for the outsider. But this is typically accomplished by watering down identity. Those with a weak, benign Christian identity are happy to participate in interfaith activities and to engage in all sorts of exploration and questioning of their faith. But exactly what they believe sometimes gets a little fuzzy. Most mainline or many mainline congregations such as ours operate and live somewhere on this part of the continuum, this weak, benign end of the continuum. And if we can articulate very well what we believe, it often is a faith in a generic God who fits easily into our political beliefs. Just don't ask us much in the way of specifics about what God is like, what God expects or requires of us, how God is present to us, or, or how God is going to move and act in the world. McLaren, in his book, wants Christians to reject this, tradi this traditional continuum, to forge an identity that has nothing to do with that, to come up with something he calls strong, benevolent identity. And while he doesn't actually use this term, I wonder if his is not a prophetic call for us to shake off our own spiritual amnesia. Over the past year or so, many mainline progressive Christians have struggled with the state of our nation. Some have felt a strong need to do something, to affect change. Many participated in more secular things, such as the Women's March. And there have been more explicitly religious responses to issues such as racism. Uh, there was even a a minister's march against racism in D.C. this past year. But at the same time, I have seen and heard a great deal of, of disbelief and despair. Many worry, fear for the fate of the nation, for the fate of the church. And in part because our more evangelical conservative cousins do have a stronger sense of identity. They are much more the public face of the church in our world. And I wonder if all of us, both conservative and progressive, don't suffer from various forms of spiritual amnesia. Many evangelicals seem to be pursuing political power and in the process forgetting the ways of God. And many progressives seem to have created a faith that is more philosophy and vague spirituality than anything grounded in the person of Jesus in the God to whom human plans and schemes are but a passing fancy who brings to naught princes 
and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Very often, we either think that all of it depends on us fixing it, or we despair that it's all going to hell. The other day, I heard a progressive colleague say, I think I have preached Jesus more in the past year than I have in all my years of ministry. And I wonder if this is not the prophetic word we most need to hear right now, a call to remember. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? The God who is creator and ruler of all the cosmos has taken on bodily form and come for our sakes. And Christ gives power to the weak, strengthens the powerless. Those who trust and wait on him shall renew their strength. And so, we will hope, we will pray for God's kingdom, for God's new day. We will pray and we will work for God's will to be done on earth. And we will not despair. For we remember, we remember who God is and what God has done. And so we shall mount up with wings like eagles, shall run and not be weary, shall walk and not faint. Thanks be to God.